Welcome into Ride the Line, the greatest podcast in sports betting entertainment. My name is Tanner Kern, certified G, bona fide stud, and you can't teach that. And this right here, this is G Money Grant Mitchell. We are breaking down the best NBA and college basketball picks for Friday, March the 15th. And you can't teach that. Bada boom, man of the people in the room. Welcome into Ride the Line, G Money Grant Mitchell. How you doing? Doing good, Tanner. It's Friday. Can't really complain too much. Got an exciting weekend coming up. And of course, Selection Sunday. Again, we've been talking about it all week. This is the best time of year to be a sports fan. It's it's this, um, the World Series, and the Super Bowl, and then the World Cup. I know we talked about it. You said you're not a huge World Cup guy, but those are probably the best times in the sports calendar. I, I don't classify the World Cup as the best time in the sports calendar. That's just me. That's me. Oh, and the Olympics. And the Olympics. Olympics is good. I like winter better than summer, though. Like really? winter, yeah, I do like winter better than summer. I don't know what's what's the what's the, it's like because when you look at like winter and summer, okay, in the winter you get figure skating, in the summer you get gymnastics. That's kind of like the two marquee events. Like that's the prime time events every night. Gymnastics is not the marquee event. What are you talking? No, what what's the marquee event? What are you serious? Gymnastics is the marquee event of the Summer Olympics. Yes, one hundred. There's no way. No, no. That's the primetime event that's always on, Grant. It's gymnastics. No, you get everything. Women's, gym, women's get, gymnastics. No, first of all, it's it's probably the 100-meter dash. I would say is the most popular event at the Olympics. You've got swimming. You've got basketball. Um, isn't baseball being added soon? You're going to have baseball yeah, nobody soon. Cares, nobody cares about baseball and basketball. It's about the the, the primetime event. Like the the pri- I would say swimming. Swimming, I will say that. Track, I don't think as much. Swimming. And figure, not figure skating, gymnastics. But when you see it, gymnastics is the primetime event. I could not disagree more. I think the 100-meter dash is probably the most watched event at the Olympics. I'm just talking about in general, Graham. I'm talking about from the whole scale of it. Like, to separate the 100-meter dash from track. Put, put it in the track and field bucket. Put it in the gymnastics bucket. If you look at what's on primetime summer Olympics, it is going to be gymnastics. When I hear Olympics, I think swimming and track. Those are like the top two things that I think of. But you got to separate the buckets, Grant. I, I mean, I I am like separating the buckets. I think swimming and track. I think those are the two most popular events. Oh I wonder if there's a way to look this up. Hold on. There is swimming's third, tracks two, gymnastics is one. Bang. Is it really? Yeah, Grant. I according to who? <laughs> according to ranking the top ten most popular Olympic sports, Bleacher Report. Most popular sports at the U.S. Olympics 2021. Let's see. Gymnastics. Okay, this is from eight years ago. This is number one. 2021 Summer Olympics. Gymnastics It was the most popular sport at 35%. Swimming was 34%. Gymnastics, ry- rhythmic gymnastics, 28%. Diving, 25%. Basketball, 22%. I'm telling you, Grant. Fair look enough. At, look at the U.S. women's team. That's that's all. That's all they show at the Summer Olympics. That's why I don't like it as much. Fair enough. I I never would have guessed that, but evidently I was wrong. Well, I think track's more interesting if you look at some of the events, but like just from a whole perspective, like you take the, the whole thing. But anyways, anyways. <laughs> the balance beam, the the the, the floor routine, well, it's um, the, the it's uneven the, bars. It's the team event. I think that's what probably does the best. The team event and the the Winter Olympics. It's just figure skating. Like that's what people. I like hockey and all that, but no, again, nobody. People care about those two sports. Anyways, enough enough Olympic talk. Enough Olympic talk. Done. We got to talk about picks. Grant, yeah, subscribe do. to the channel. Are you subscribed to the channel? Am I? Of course I'm subscribed. What kind of question is go. that? You got to subscribe, guys, like Grant. If you're not <laughs> subscribed to the channel, I don't know what you're doing with your life. I don't know what you're doing on a day-to-day basis. Like This is the channel, the sports channel to subscribe to. We got tons of offers for you guys. We got tons of picks. We got free content on the site. WSN is a damn massive entity, and we have so much content for you guys. So make sure you go down, subscribe, and check out all the links in the description below. Yep, 100%. Well said, Tanner. I think we should switch it up today because you got a little unlucky with the Duke Blue Devils yesterday or Wednesday. Um, and I know that. Wait, no. Was it yesterday? I don't, it was, I, I don't no, know. It wasn't a show pick. It was like a ladder. It was. A ladder OK, yeah, yeah, that's what it was. But either way, you, you got hosed by the Blue Devils. And I know that you are eager to get back on the wagon here. So why don't you kick us off with some college basketball? Yeah, I didn't hesitate last night. We were back on the ladder challenge. If you guys don't know what the ladder challenge, $10 to 10K, we're trying to flip it. We were on day four. We had a four-leg parlay. We hit three of the legs. The last leg was the Duke Blue Devils. But there, there's something called a championship DNA. You ever heard of it? You know what a championship DNA is, Grant? Uh, yes, I have heard the term before. You've heard championship DNA? Okay. A championship DNA is a team that when they get down, when they get kicked in the 
freaking you know what. They're able to get back up. They're able to say, hey, we can shake it. We're a better team. We're going to come out and play. I look at UConn. We're going to talk about UConn on the show in a minute here. UConn was up one point to Xavier yesterday in the first half. They were playing terrible. They went down like 9 nothing to start the game. They came back. They were only up a point at the half. They came out and beat the ever-loving crap out of Xavier. Xavier did not want to play basketball anymore by the 10-minute mark of the second half. UConn beat them into submission. That's a championship DNA. That's a team that's bought in and knows, hey, we're fine. We're a better team. We're going to respond. Duke is not that team. So I'm watching the Duke game last night, and Duke was playing NC State. NC State wanted to win that game. NC State beat them up. They punched them in the mouth, and Duke was unable to respond. But at the half, they gave a stat. Duke had been down seven times at the half in the regular season. They were one in six in those games. Their one win was over Southern Indiana. That's a team that can't respond. That's a team that shouldn't have been in the top 10 or the top 15, where the hell they were at. They came out and they lost as a 10 and a half point favorite. And that ruined my parlay. But anyways, it doesn't matter because North Carolina, even if we get to a Duke UNC final in the ACC championship game, Carolina is going to beat them because they're just simply a better team. Carolina is the fourth ranked team in the country. They're going against Pittsburgh tonight. I like UNC minus the seven and a half. You look at Carolina, the biggest reason they've been able to win games is they're able to score two star players. Um, The first being R.J. Davis. He's been fantastic. 21 points this season. Not great efficiency from the field, but still a score. He's going to take a lot of shots. And then Armando Baycott, 13.9 points per game, 10 rebounds, so doing a 13-10 double-double. He's been fantastic. Looking at how they've played so far and how they've played down the stretch, they've won one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games in a row. They have been fantastic in one game against Pittsburgh this season. Um, they beat them 70 to 57. So playing very well there as well. They're going against Pittsburgh tonight. Again, Pittsburgh beat Wake Forest 81 69 yesterday. Very good win for them. But still, I trust North Carolina. I think they're a better team. I think they're one of the best teams in the country. And for 20 to 1 right now to win the national championship, they have a ton of value. I I definitely agree with that. Pittsburgh, you know, they're sneakily good. I think they can definitely put up a challenge in this one. Um, But what I look at is with this UNC team, if this game is close down the stretch, they are able to shoot free throws. A lot of college teams can't. We talk about that. Also, RJ Davis, the uh, ACC player of the year, a guy with an awful lot of experience. He's at 89% at the line, so he's pretty much cash there. Um, And I know you said he's not overly efficient. He still shoots the three really well, about 42% there. So you can definitely live with that. Baycott is just a monster on the inside. He's also highly experienced. Um, So this is a team that has been through a bunch of ACC tournament runs. And I do think you trust and you value experience in this spot. Can I tell you something very interesting about uh, UNC here? Yeah. So I was looking at the latest edition of Joe Lenardi's Bracketology. Um, Well, I shouldn't say the latest edition because I was looking at it yesterday. Um, And I'm sure it's been updated with some of the results from the conference tournaments. But he had UNC as the two seed in the North region, I believe. And you know who else was there? UConn and Kentucky. Now, UNC played both of those teams. Um, They played UConn. They lost by 11. And they played Kentucky and they lost by four. But even with that said, I don't even think it's so much about the result. I think it's the fact that they already played both those teams and vice versa. So, like, there's a certain level of familiarity with these teams. Like, a lot of the time, you know, we're going to see – I don't know. We'll see, like, Gonzaga play Houston. Like, those teams are going to play each other in the regular season. You know what I mean? These guys have actually already played, which I find very interesting if they do and all end up in the same region. I think if Carolina wins the ACC, they were saying last night they could get a one seed potentially. I think they probably could. Yeah. So we'll I see. mean, they're the number they're ranked fourth in the country right now, I believe. Yeah. They're the fourth ranked team in the country. If they win the ACC now with Duke losing, like not that Duke was ever in Duke was in line for a two seed, but now Duke will fall off and they'll move out. So that yeah, should be interesting. Yeah. I think, I think the ones were, I think the ones were Houston, Purdue, Tennessee, and I don't remember who the other one was. Houston, Purdue, that- Tennessee, it, it, Arizona was in line for it. I don't Arizona, think that's who it was, yeah. Yeah, it was a pick em between Arizona and one other. Houston, yeah, and then potentially Carolina as well. I think. It's going to be U- UConn, UConn, Houston, and uh, Purdue are the three that are wrapped up. And then that last one's up for grabs. Yeah, I wouldn't surprise me if UNC gets in there, though. Like, I think they have a really good, cha- really good chance. Definitely. All right, Grant, give me an NBA pick. 
Okay, so I'm going to look at the under of 213.5 in the Miami Heat-Detroit Pistons matchup here. So this one's pretty interesting for me. Um, the Heat are coming off of a 100-88 to loss to the Denver Nuggets. Um, that was good, some good old school basketball. We've seen a lot of low-scoring games. I think the under's like 62%. Uh, 62% hit rate since the All-Star break. So games have typically been trending under. Detroit likes to try to play fast, but at the same time, Miami is the aggressor here, and they play at a much slower pace. So I think with their defense and their methodical offense, they're going to be able to slow the pace down, and obviously slower pace leads to fewer points being scored. Um, also, Miami's offense really has not been the best, again, since the All-Star break. They're like 17th in offensive rating. Jimmy Butler turned it up and then stepped off just a little bit. Uh, Terry Rozier has been very hit or miss. Bam's been pretty good, but at the same time, we know what Bam is. You know, he's like a 20, 21 point per game score. He's not going to light you up and go for 35 or 40 um some of the three-point shooting has been hit or miss there was one point where they were super hot but then they went super cold and then obviously it's it's the detroit pistons Cade cunningham's looked good but they they just don't really have a whole lot to offer on the offensive end um and so again when i think about the style when i think about also the fact that miami is coming off of that loss i think you're going to see them give a really good effort even though it is only the detroit pistons um so yeah i just think the under makes a lot of sense here given the way that the games have been trending ever since the all-star break I like oh, it. Oh, and also, also, sorry. Miami does hit the under at the second highest rate in basketball. They hit unders at 63%. Detroit's just about 50 50. I like it. I like it. How about, hey, how about the Knicks? I didn't see the score last night. Did they, they didn't hold the team under 80 again, did they? No, they did not. Um, I here, let me pull it up. I think it was 100 something to 90 something. Oh, so it still stayed, still stayed under the total then. It was 105 to 93. Yeah. They'll still stayed under easily, but they were next playing good basketball right now. Good defense, physical. Yeah. I, like I mean, it, it's wild to me that in the era of load management, you've got Tom Thibodeau playing guys like 45 minutes a night and just saying, you know, it is what it is. Screw it. It's champion, championship DNA. That's what it is. <laughs> I, I mean, there's no doubt that a Tom Thibodeau team has grit. Like you have to have uh, Josh Hart did a funny interview um, when OG and Anobi came back for his first game. Our, uh, Josh Hart got to play 39 minutes and he said, like, yeah, I guess Tibbs has gone soft on me. He's not playing me 40 minutes anymore. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I like it. Like if you're if you're built to handle it, then more power to you. But just from the physical effects, like, again, if you're when you add up, if, if you say one of my players is going to play 42 minutes per night and then yours is going to play 35. By the time we get to the playoffs, my guy has already played probably like an extra 10 games. So it's going to add up at some point. But if you're built for it, then I guess you're built for it. Well, the, the best teams are gritty. That's what it comes down. The best team in every sport. If you're a gritty team, you're a better team. Typically, you're more physical. You're more mentally trained. Like, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. So my pick here, we're going to go with the team that has a championship DNA. That's, that's the word of the day is championship DNA. And that's the, the Connecticut Huskies. Uh, UConn is going against St. John's tonight. This is going to be a tighter game than I think a lot of people expect. Um, in the two games that they've played this season, they've actually been relatively tight. They beat St. John's at home by four earlier in the year, and then they played them a few weeks, but a couple a month back about, and they beat them by 13 points. But again, St. John's has been in these games. They've really struggled to finish down the stretch. Funny quote last night from Rick Pitino after the game. They said, hey, what do you need to do? You saw this? What oh, do you I was going to see if you saw it, yeah. Yeah, I saw a Barstool tweet. It's like, what do, what do you need to happen? And like, we need six guys to get COVID on UConn. I don't think that's the case, honestly. I think St. John's is good enough to win this game straight up if they play their best game. But the thing about, like, when you're playing these top teams, and I credit North Carolina State last night, Duke gave them every opportunity to take advantage of their mistakes, and they took advantage of them. So for St. John's, if UConn comes out, plays their best game, they're not going to lose. But if UConn does not play their best game and St. John's takes advantage of their mistakes, they have a chance to win the game. That's the way it's going to happen. But I still like UConn to come out hot in this one. I like them to cover five and a half in the first half. The biggest thing for UConn yesterday, they came out, they were terrible. Um, they went down, as I said, seven nothing, nine nothing in that range, and they only won the first half by a point. I think they're going to come out hot because they have a little momentum. They've played at Madison Square Garden already yesterday. They're ready to go for this one. Hurley's going to set the intensity, and um, they have a ton of great scores. You got Tristan Newton there. You got Cam Spencer, and you have Donovan Klingon. Klingon can't get into foul trouble. He's going to be going against Joel Soriano, who is a very physical center for St. John's, doing a 14 10 double double per game. Um, but I still think UConn's just got too much firepower to lose. I think St. John's can keep it close down the stretch, but I like UConn to come out hot and cover that five and a half in the first half. 
I would just be a little wary because to your point of what happened yesterday. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily have a pick in this one. I do think UConn is clearly the better team. Um, and Patino, those comments can work both ways. Honestly, like if you're on St. John's and he says that, do you have the, do you have the, uh, uh, the level headedness to say he's just being kind of tongue in cheek, you know, he's playing around here. Or if your coach says that, are you looking at him a little funny for me personally? I'm probably looking at him like me, me now, like, uh, oh, it's just cool. It's a joke. But as a player, I'm probably looking at it a little funny. Like we're about to face not you talk about championship DNA. It's literally the champions. Like we are about to face the champions, the best team in college basketball. I want my coach going all in, setting a fire. That doesn't do it for me. Well, I like what he said after the game. You know, like he after the game, he was like, they asked him, you know, what what's your thoughts on, you know, UConn tomorrow? He's like, there we have it doesn't mean we're not going to play them hard, but we have a ton of respect for them. That's a way to say it. Um, I don't like the COVID comment as far as if I'm a player, I, I don't want to hear that because they could try he's to saying, prove it. He's off. saying my team isn't good enough to win. Yeah, he's saying we don't have a chance to beat UConn. That's basically what he said. And I guess you lost by four and you lost by 13. And realistically, if UConn plays their best game, they don't have a chance to beat them. But they any anything can happen like and uh, UConn just did not play their best game 24 hours ago UConn didn't play their best half you saw yeah. like I well mean, you're betting on the first half here so <laughs> but that was that was yesterday too that was after you know Xavier had played a game already oh we saw it yesterday all these teams struggled to get going like a lot of the teams if you don't if the teams that play in the first and second round games before the quarterfinal when the big dogs come in they have an advantage like they're ready to go they've been in the, they've been in the stadium before they played a game i think that makes a huge difference like biggest thing from hurley probably went in there whooped their whooped their ass and came out and they they played on fire if they come out and play that way they their second half they bring that in the first half today st st johns is not going to keep up with them no i definitely agree with that and i think you're spot on about the the teams that are already playing, it's easier to carry that momentum in. Yeah. And again, they're, they're college kids. Back to back is not going to make them tired. They're, they're yeah. ready to go. Yeah. 100%. I agree with that. Okay. Tanner, my second pick. Um, and this actually, cause you went first today. So this is going to be our final pick here. Um, I'm going to take it to a prop. Cause to be honest, I don't like a whole lot of these spreads and totals on the board today. Um, I just think a lot of those games are, I think the lines are just very, very fairly priced. Um, but a prop that I do like is Miles bridges, uh, miles bridges over two and a half threes against the Phoenix suns here. Um, if there's one thing we know about miles bridges, it's that he's, he's not afraid to shoot. He, he's going to get his shots up. Um, this month he's averaging just about seven threes per game, only shooting 32%, but a high volume guy made three threes in both of his last two games um one against the grizzlies who are a good defense one against the pistons who are not but i mean this phoenix suns aren't exactly a defensive juggernaut either phoenix also this was crazy i don't know if you got to watch their game against the celtics they allowed boston to go 25 of 50 from three having the ability to even take 53 point attempts is wild to shoot 50 percent is crazy and to do it in the same game, so you make 25 threes, that's ridiculous. Since the All-Star break, Phoenix is allowing opponents to make the second most threes per game. Um, also, you look at some of the matchups here. I don't know if they're going to start Royce O'Neal on Miles Bridges or Brandon Miller. I would assume it would be Bridges. Um, Royce O'Neal has really not been playing well recently. Wouldn't be surprised to see his minutes get cut. He also doesn't have the size to match up with Bridges. Um, and Charlotte likes to do this thing where they they drive and they kick it out to the shooters a lot. So you're going to see some help side rotations. The defense is going to collapse. Bridges, again, even if he's covered, it doesn't matter. He's going to take the shot. It doesn't matter if it's a, it's a bad shot. He'll take it. Um, so, yeah, I just think this is a matchup that bodes well with the way that things have been going. I like you, Grant. I, I don't, you, you do a very good job explaining the NBA picks. We're on the back end of it. You know, you got you got good explanations there. I agree with the pick. I like that. I like the under in the other game. So feeling good there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's um, it's funny. I have like 10 to 15 NBA.com tabs open at all time. And I'll, I'll just poke around because stuff like that. Um, you know, if you're looking at like an assist prop. Um, in fact, I think I have one with Paolo Bancaro. Like just look at how many assists the Toronto's Raptors have allowed since, you know, the last 10 games, last 15 games. Look at the pace they play at. Like, oh, well. They'll, they're top 10 in assists allowed, like or bottom 10, I should say. And then they played a fast pace. That means a lot of possessions, a lot of open passes. Like it, it just makes sense to look at an assist prop there. Well, that's, I mean, that's what prop betting is. It's like just comparing all these different numbers and stats in every sport. I think basketball is one of the, the best for it. 
because you can find all these individual matchups and like their sites where it's how do how many assists do teams give up to guards per game? How many do they give up to forwards and all this stuff? So keep crushing it, Grant. Grant's been Grant's been hot on WSN.com. Thank you. I will say the uh the spread picks have have it's been a couple a rough couple of weeks, but with that being said, we're still at 60% against the spread. So like we've gone from 63% to 60%. So I mean it's still not like it's bad. No, that's good. So good. 60% still crushing it. I'll tell you what, you know who's going to crush it today? UConn. UConn and UNC. UConn and UNC. <laughs> Give me U- UConn matters a lot more to me, but let's get it. Anyways, that was Ride the Line, guys. Grace Podcast and Sports Betting Entertainment. Grant, take us out of here. Before you guys get on out of here, do Tanner and I a big favor. We are here giving you the picks, so you can do take two seconds out of your day. Hit that subscribe button. Like the video if you did enjoy. Comment. Let us know who you're going to be betting on this weekend, and we will catch you all in the next episode of Ride the Line.